today. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend at Allison Park Church. Why don't you worship with me today? Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. Who can carry that kind of weight? It was my sin till I met you. I was dreaming, but not alive. All oh, my failures I tried.
Come on all across this room today, let your faith rise, sing. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. We're going to go into one final song here like we usually do. It's a new one that we introduced a couple weeks ago called Common Ground. And what this song is about is just remembering and thanking Jesus, what he did for us on the cross. So as we go into this last song, if you're comfortable, would you just stretch out your hands? And this is just a simple of surrender and just saying, God, I give my life to you. I put my trust in you. Let's worship you together this morning. You're so worthy, Jesus. Come to a common ground there before the cross. Once a hill known as Calvary, level ground for us. Look to the His arms stretch against the sky. I call of His grace. Savior here at the Savior's feet with a cross.
Allison hey. Park Church online fam. We are so pumped to be hanging out with you for this experience. Thank you so much for joining us. My name's Becca, if we haven't had the chance to meet. Yeah, my name is Sean. Yeah, and we got a lot of exciting things going on here at Allison Park Church. And if you want to hear more about those, you can check out our website or our app for more info. Yeah, and this week we are in our sermon series, The Chosen, where we're watching clips of the show live together as well as in life groups and discussing it throughout the week. Do the copyright. We unfortunately cannot show those clips here. So we want to encourage you to follow along with The Chosen at home. So we have a link in the, in the description where you can find The Chosen, where to watch that. We're watch, I'll watch all the episodes. I'd say go and binge it. We also have a, a link to our website that you can click on where you can watch the message along with the clips of The Chosen. Or if you just want to continue watching along here right now, you will be able to watch the message just without those chosen clips. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get ready to listen to a message from Pastor Jeff Leak. So again, we're doing a series on The Chosen, which is a you know program that's been created two seasons. We've been studying it in life groups and season three coming out real, real soon. And we're studying in this series, The Life of Jesus. And I thought, isn't that the perfect clip to show on election week right there? How about that? So uh, my name is Jeff. I'm, I'm the lead pastor here at Allison Park Church. Wherever you're joining us, one of our locations, Ohio River, we love you guys online. Wherever you're a part of this, we're glad you've joined us today. And I'll just say, wow, you guys look great with an extra hour of sleep. I think this is my favorite holiday. In fact, why don't you turn to my, your neighbor and on your right or left and say, you look better when you sleep a little bit extra. Come on now. Just tell them that for a moment. Wow. That's what you've been needing all along. You needed more sleep, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So, so I, I said this clip was a kind of an interesting one for uh, you know election day. Of course, you know it's Tuesday, and I, I have to just say to you, I'm go- on Wednesday morning. I'm going to miss all the commercials. Uh, I'm going to miss all the, the stuff filling my inbox. You know, my people texting me from random places. I don't know about you. No, but we know we know this is important, right? Let me just encourage you. We are blessed to live in the United States of America. We have the freedom to be a part of the process and to vote. Can I get an amen from somebody, right? And so we we honor those who run for office, whether it be school board or local government or in the state or in the federal government, and we pray over those that, that are elected as our leaders. And so we encourage you to take the step to vote. And if you're looking for a little bit of a filter for, for who do you vote for, I actually shared with this, with this with you a couple of months ago when we talked about uh, three C's to uh, consider hiring somebody. The first one is character. So you look at their character, what you can see and know of them based upon what you have seen and hear. The second is competence. Can they do the job? Would you hire them for this job? And then the third, we say chemistry. How, how do you relate to them? Do they fit in with you? And probably for a voting decision, it may be more something like congruence, which is, do they align with my values, with what the Bible teaches? Do they align with my worldview? So these are just good filters for us. But we also recognize this, that no matter what happens on Tuesday, we believe that God is in control and that our allegiance is to the kingdom of God first and foremost beyond anything else. Wave at me if you're in agreement with that one. All right. Yes, very good. So we're glad you joined us today. And you know, one of the things that was true in the era Jesus was on earth is there was somewhat of a misunderstanding, especially amongst his disciples, about what he had come to do. Remember, the Jews for thousands of years were waiting for a deliverer, a Messiah to come. And they had been under Roman oppression. That was the current situation they were in. But they had been under other oppressions before that of various governments that were over them. And they were longing for the Messiah to come and to take over, to reestablish the kingdom of Israel on earth, to overthrow their enemies to bring about righteousness back into the world, to bring a just society. And so they were longing for Jesus to show up. And so when James and John, the two that we see here, who are part of Jesus' 12 disciples, when they show up in the world, they have an expectation that Jesus is going to show up as the conqueror, as a political leader, as a military leader even. And so they're waiting for this. And they can see he's demonstrating his messiahship by signs and wonders and miracles. And so certainly... He's ready to do this. And so they were lining up and ready to help him enforce the kingdom of God on earth. And so when they were in Samaritan territory, who were their enemies and rivals, and they had encountered offense, 
they instantly said, let's pull out some Old Testament prophet stuff and let's call down fire from heaven to consume these Samaritans. And this was so foreign to the way of Jesus that he rebukes them in this moment and he reorients them towards his mission on earth. Now, I think this is good for the context of a larger polarization that we're experiencing in society, but it's also important, I think, for us to understand some things about the teaching of Jesus. If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, when we're talking about anybody who's getting on our nerves, anybody who's an offense toward us, anybody that we would see as a rival, anyone that we're in conflict with, there is a particular Jesus way or response to how we deal with these kinds of things when they happen in our life. And one of the encouragements that we see in the scripture is that James and John, so remember Jesus had 12 disciples and he had three of the 12 that he brought close to him, James, John, and Simon Peter. And James and John were brothers. He nicknames them sons of thunder there. You hear that. And, 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 and so these guys get it wrong over and over and over again. In fact, we're going to study where this, this little episode comes from in Luke chapter 9. If you want to turn in your Bibles there or take your device and go there, we'll put verses on the screen for you as well. It's encouraging to know that the two, two of the three closest to Jesus got it wrong in this particular passage three times. And why is that encouraging? Because I get it wrong a whole lot more than that. I don't know about you. And so when I see these guys so close to Jesus messing up, I think, okay, maybe, maybe there's hope for me too. And here's, I guess we're going to state the position of Jesus and how he was thinking about things in the world. Jesus was not so much focused, he was focused on people, we should say, not so much on power. They, they thought he would be oriented around establishing his power in the world, but he actually came to focus on people. And, and he was really interested less in control and more on influence, how he could build his influence and share the influence of what he'd come to bring in the world, which was the kingdom of God. So he came to focus on people, not power, influence, not control. And this is part of what messed with the disciples' heads as they were, as they were trying to follow his lead. And so we're going to go now, Luke chapter 9, verse 43, and here's what it tells us. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about about to tell you, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Okay, we'll leave that verse on the screen. Let me give you background. Verse 43, while they were marveling at what he had done. Okay, just in this same chapter, here's what had happened previous to this verse. I said there's these top three disciples that Jesus um, kind of shared, was more transparent with than the others. James, John, and Simon Peter. In the same chapter, he brings these three up into what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, And there the glory of God shines upon the person of Jesus Christ, son of God in in the flesh. And Moses and Elijah show up in the picture, right? They appear together, the three of them. And this is where Simon Peter says, maybe we should just pause this and build tabernacles and hang out here. We'll have a little retreat center. It's just going to be great what's happening. And, And then the two disappear and God speaks about the son and then they, they, they leave that place and they go down the mountain and instantly they encounter a demon-possessed young man and Jesus delivers him from demons. And as they're walking along, they're going through Samaritan territory and we hit verse 43. As they were all marveling at what Jesus had done and what they had just seen, Jesus began to tell them, look, my enemies are coming after me and they're gonna take me and they're gonna kill me. He starts to unfold. There's there's a process of redemption. You expect me to come and dominate, but I've actually come to die. (laughs) And this is something they had a hard time getting. In fact, the next verse, verse 45, he, he says, but they did not understand what he meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it. They were afraid to ask him about it. And you can see here that they did not grasp it because what just is said in the next sentence, and that's this, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. So so just think how odd this is now. Jesus is walking through Samaritan territory and says, by the way, they're going to kill me. They're going to hand me over to the people who hate me, and they're going to kill me, and this is part of my mission. And they're like, hmm, I wonder what that means. You know, who do you think will be vice president when he comes into his kingdom? Like, what are you guys thinking? How Right now you're arguing about that? Like, did you not just hear what I had to say? I'm sure Jesus was somewhat mystified with how badly they missed the point so often. 
And, and so here's the deal. See, they expected that when Jesus came, he came to rule. And when he came to rule, they were with him. So they would rule with him. So now here they're going to have power and status. And they're going to be the you know, secretary of state and vice presidents. And they're going to be put in charge of things. And so they're now debating, you know, okay, you know, they're taking selfies together. You know, Simon Peter's like, look how many followers I have on Instagram, right? You know, they, they're, they've got image, you know, proposals. They're, they're looking at who, who Jesus talked to, who, who he gave permission to do something last time because they're all vying for this position and this power and they're just totally missing the mindset of what Jesus had come to do in this world. So it says then, verse 47, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. And then he said to him, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me for it is the one who is least among you who is the greatest. Now, Jesus had this up, upside down and backwards view of the world that the disciples didn't get and that our culture doesn't get and that I have a struggle to get. And that's the idea that Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. This is what he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45 about his mission on earth. And that if you want to be great, let me just see if you can get the fill in on this. This is another parallel passage. Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you have to be, can you say it? A servant of all, right? So, so now that you know the answer, you can say it. Ready? If you want to be great in his kingdom, you have to be servant, right? You have to be a servant of all. So Jesus has this weird view of the world, like, no, no, if you want to be great, you got to be on top. If you want to be great, you got to be famous. If you want to be great, you've got to have the power. If, you've got to, if you want to be great, you've got to be wealthy. If you want to be great, you've got to be popular and looked up. You've got to be the decision maker. And Jesus said, look, you guys are thinking about the wrong stuff here. And he calls a little child, and he has him stand with him. Now, here's the first point, and that's this. Jesus was saying, my mission is, is about the willingness to be last, not the ambition to be first. And then he, again, the idea is I didn't come to, to I came, did not come to be served, sorry, but rather to serve and give my life for others. So, so he brings the little child up and he has the child stand next to him. And he says, if you take the time to welcome or care for or pay attention to someone, I picture like a five or six-year-old boy or girl standing here. If you take the time to focus on and care about children like this, you'll be doing something great in my eyes. So what, what did the child represent? The small, the insignificant, the unimportant in the eyes of the world, the overlooked, the forgotten. He could have said something like this. Have you happened to notice the people that I'm paying attention to? When I come into town, who do I look for? The leper, the outcast, the sinner, the tax collector, the, the person who is unable to walk, th those who are carrying damage in their life. Look, the people that the rest of society, the people who have the power overlook, I'm, I'm coming for these ones, like this little child. And if you'll spend your life caring for the one who everybody else steps over, then you'll have greatness in my eyes. It's a completely backwards way of thinking when we think of the world system that we're a part of, but the kingdom of God is a revolution. In fact, I'll just, I was recalling as I was thinking about this particular story of Jesus with the little child and the point of that particular moment about a, a priest, a Catholic priest, who actually um, passed away in 1996. He wrote a lot of books. His name is Harry Nowen, and one of the books that he wrote is a book called In the Name of Jesus. And he, in that book, describes his journey. Henry was a professor at several universities. He had titles and doctorates, and he was a great communicator, a great author. He was invited to speak at all the big conferences. And at some point in time, he became convicted that his life was not reflecting Jesus the way he wanted it to. And so he resigned his position as a professor, and he stopped saying yes to the conferences for a season to take a position as a caregiver in Toronto, Ontario for those who are mentally and physically challenged. So he took a position in a center that was caring for those that had intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, and he spent his time emptying bedpans and sitting with those who couldn't communicate and paying attention to those who were often overlooked. And he said it was in this move from position and power to 
the place of service that he found he was representing Jesus best. Now, now, I don't know, we all have to make that kind of radical decision, but it does sort of challenge us to think about how Jesus operates, and that is focusing on people, not power, and especially the ones like the little child. And Jesus said, if you'll just take the time to get, get in a place where you're, you're concerned about the people nobody else thinks about that can't pay you back for anything. Because remember, he said, you know, the, the, the religious leaders, they like to take the leading places at the, at the dinners and banquets, and they wear all this fine clothes to be able to show how powerful they are, and, and they often want to be the head of everything, but that's not how it is with you, he said in another passage. He said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to learn to be the servant of everybody else. And so the, the disciples, they just struggled with this. I told you, James and John get it wrong. They get it wrong three times in this passage. Let's see the second time right here. So he just does this little teaching, okay, right? The little, babe, the little child's there, and he gives this teaching about his mission and pay attention to the people that, that you know, no one else looks at. And then John says in, in um, Luke chapter 49, Master, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. And then Jesus said, do, do not stop him, for whoever is not against you, it's for you. Okay, here, here's mistake number two. Okay, aren't you encouraged by other people's mistakes? I am. Okay, so James and John, mistake number two, here's what it says. My approach, Jesus was saying, is about building bridges, not building walls. They're like, look, these, there's people out there and they're using your name and they're, they're people being set free because they're saying, and look, they're not part of us. They didn't go through the training. They, they didn't get their membership card. They weren't invited to the party. We don't know who these people are. They could be damaging your reputation, Jesus. We better protect things here. I mean, you got a movement going on here. We don't want things to be watered down. Should we rebuke them? Should we tell them, look, you don't belong to us. No, 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 don't use the name of Jesus. And Jesus looks at them like, where are you guys from? Like, what is going on with you? Do you not understand what I've come to do? I've come to invite the world to myself, not to drive people away. I'm not building some exclusive club that only the special people belong to. I've called people to myself that no one else thinks belongs. And you're trying to build a wall here? I mean, this is, again, the mindset that so easily, easily settles in on us that there are certain people that are in and there are certain people that are out. And a part of our job as faithful followers of Jesus is to make sure no one gets in that shouldn't be in, right? Now, I do get that there's a balance to this. Here's the balance. Remember, in September, I talked about the fact that God had given me a prophetic warning dream that there could be wolves in sheep's clothing that are finding their way into the house of God and representing things that are, have nothing to do with Jesus. And actually, Jesus warns us about these wolves that have a ferocious desire to consume and destroy who will show up looking the part and wearing the label. And, and so I don't think that in any way, you know, see, on this side of the balance is we have to be, be aware that it is possible to ally with someone who will bring compromise into your theology or into your, your walk with God. You just can't partner with everybody. There is some point where you say, no, no, I, I actually... Don't think that's right right there. Like I, what you're saying right there, that doesn't align with what I understand about who Jesus is at all. I love you, but look, I can't agree with that. In fact, you actually see this when Jesus is ministering to the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. She tries to start a religious debate with him. You know, he says, I want to offer you water that will quench your thirst. And she's like, well, the Samaritans say we should worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. And, and the Jews say that we should worship in Jerusalem. And what do you think? He, he's trying to distract from her pain. She was bringing all this theological debate. And Jesus doesn't affirm her theology. He doesn't say, it doesn't really matter what you believe. You know, theology is not important. He doesn't say that. He says, the Jews, we worship what we know. And you Samaritans worship what you think you know. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. He says, what I really want to know is where's your husband? And she says, I have no husband. And she goes, I know you've had five. And the guy you're living with now isn't your husband. And so he begins to now point what's going on in her life. It wasn't like he compromised his theology for her. So, okay, there is a line here. But then here's the other side of the spectrum. One is we're worried about compromise. But here's what's happened in our culture. If, I, if you even vary from me a little bit, I'll cancel you. Right, Like, I'll X you out. I'll say, you're dangerous and you're hostile. And this is part of why our world is so polarized, is the 
impulse to cancel somebody, whatever side of the argument you're on, is pretty intense. And there are other people around you that say, how can you talk to them? I mean, don't you see, like this is James and John. Jesus, they're, they're using your name and they shouldn't be. And, and look, we, we gotta make sure that nobody's misrepresenting. You see, somewhere between compromise and cancellation is the place that we live in, which is the place of connection and collaboration and conversation. Do you like all those C words? I worked on that ahead of time, right? Okay, so, right, right. So this is where we wanna live, in building bridges where we're saying to people who are on this side, hey, come over here and let's talk. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened, but I want you to know him for who he truly is. And let's say to the people over here, look, you've got no mean. Come on, come back over here in the middle where we can laugh and have time together. You see, Jesus was saying to James and John, hey, look, you're not, we're not building a club here. We're building a movement of people who will come together and operate according to the values and standards of the kingdom of God. All right, one final little episode which we already saw portrayed for us. Same chapter. It's like mistake one, boom, you know, who's the greatest? Mistake two, how do we keep these people out? Here's mistake three. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set up for, set up for Jerusalem. Sorry. So he's headed now to be arrested, betrayed, arrested, crucified, and then raised from the grave. And he knows this is coming. And, and they're headed now through Samaria. So he sent messengers on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for them. But the people there did not welcome them. Now, what the chosen producer chose to do is show us them being spat upon. We don't know that that's actually what happens. But it wouldn't be a stretch to imagine insults and some even physical threats that are happening for the disciples in Samaritan territory. Why is this the case? Well, again, this is a lot of background for you. But real quickly, the Samaritans were to the north and the Jews were to the south. And in the Old Testament, they were called the northern and southern kingdoms, and they often fought wars for one another. They were one tribe at one point with the, the 12, one, one nation with 12 tribes, and then they split, and they fought, and then they were both taken into captivity. And during the time when the Samaritans came back, they got all mixed up. You know, their theology went off. They built their own worship center. They were a little bit racially different now than the Jews. There was a tremendous intensity of the rivalry between the Samaritans. So they were different politically, theologically, and racially, but they were very nearby, and they hated each other. And just because the two, James and John, were following Jesus didn't mean that they, they, their prejudices and experiences had left them. And so now they're going through Samaritan territory as following the one who will become the new political ruler of Israel and overthrow all their enemies. And they're walking through Samaria, right? And as they're walking through, they're getting insulted. And they're like, we should do something about this. I know, I read in the Old Testament about, about Elijah who called fire down from heaven. You know, we're in this era of the Messiah. Maybe it would be impressive to Jesus if we show our faith and we say, let's call fire down from heaven. Right? This is, can you see this in their head? We want to say, you know, come on, guys, what's wrong with you? Don't you know who he is? When the disciples, James and John, saw, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? And Jesus turned and rebuked them. And then his disciples went to another village. I love how, the, so the episode here gave us a little bit more insight to Jesus turned and rebuked him, right? And I love how they portray this. He says to them after saying, you think you're more worthy, <laughs> right? Don't you know what we're building here? And then after they calm down, he says, so you want to call fire down? <laughs> right? And then they say, when you say it like that, it sounds worse, right? <laughs> so they say, oh, what a ridiculous thing. What am I thinking? And, and so here's the deal. Third point, third point and that's this. My plan, Jesus was saying, is not to pronounce judgment on my enemies, but rather to offer them salvation, the hope of salvation and grace. And this is, this is what's so difficult. Okay, so I know we could take this in the broader con con context of our culture wars that are going on and the polarization that's happening and where we as Christians fit into the dynamic of all that. That's one application for this message. But then there's the interpersonal stuff. It's not because they're a Samaritan. It's because they're an in-law. 
<laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's, it's, not because, it's not because they're from a different political party. It's because they're a coworker and they're just always at me, right? There's, there's different things that we face and, and don't know what to do with. And the Jesus way is not easy. In, in fact, there are days, don't you wish, for the fire from heaven privilege. Don't raise your hand, but I mean, come on. If you're like me, you're like, Phew. is there any prayer? Is there any exemption here? Is there some way? Because what we want is instantaneous response that comes out of, let me just say, a place of fear. What's going to happen if they get away with this? Anger because I'm so offended at what they said or did. Shame because look at how horrible they have become. Like uh, so pride <laughs> because we feel in some way humiliated. Control because it's not going the way we want it to go. And anytime we start acting out of our emotions like that, we end up in a place that's far away from how Jesus would respond. And you say, well, how do you know? how Jesus would respond in my situation. Well, let me just give you one. I'm not going to read the scripture verse. Many of you will be familiar with this. Just before he's betrayed and arrested, he has time with his disciples. And in John chapter 13, it tells us that Jesus knew where he had come from. That he had, this is verse three, he had all power and that he was getting ready to return to his father to sit upon the throne in heaven. And when he knew this, that he had all power, when he knew who he was, when he knew what he was about ready to do, his response was, now I heard a pastor actually teach on this once and he asked the question, what would you do if you were the most powerful person in the room? If you entered the room and you were the most famous, you were the most wealthy, you were the most accomplished, you were the one that, that held all the cards, so to speak, and you could call all the shots and you were in that spot where you were clearly the most powerful person there, what would you do then? Jesus was the most powerful person in the room. So what did he do? It says he took up a towel and he wrapped it around his waist and he got down on the ground and he took his disciples' dirty feet and he washed them. Now, what's the last thing Jesus does before he goes to the cross? He takes his disciples' feet and washes them. And remember, there were 10 toes that he held in his hand, two feet that belonged to Judas. And he washes Judas' feet knowing what Judas is going to do to him. In just a few moments, Judas will, in the garden, kiss him on both cheeks and identify him as the one they were after. Jesus washes Judas' feet and expresses love that is expressed toward us, but is a challenge for us to show toward others. Now, if you're like me, you have this question. How can you do that, Jesus? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm up to that. I mean, not with this person, not with this situation, not with this experience. Listen, Jesus knew something that no one else knew. And it's true. What Jesus knew is still true today, and it's true for you and me. Here's what Jesus knew that no one else knew. He was going to go to the cross, but when they took him down from that cross and buried him in the ground, he would not stay dead, but he would rise again. And in his resurrection, he would make right everything that wasn't wrong, that was wrong before, I should say. So in his resurrection, he has the capacity to take the things that were done to you and to me that were unjust and unfair and grievous and burdensome and hurtful, and he can reverse the curse, and he can redeem our situation, and he can bring us out of what we've been in, but he can bring us out better than we were before, not down in the mud fighting it out, stuck in our grief, stuck in our anger, stuck in our fear, but overcoming by the power of his resurrection. This is where our hope is. So look, if you're thinking that you're going to solve this problem with this group or this person by taking it in on your own hands, you're just going to make a bigger mess. Can I get an amen quietly for that? But if you'll say, Lord Jesus, I'll take the pain I've experienced. I'll put it in your hands. I'll do it your way. And as I do, I trust that on the other side, you're going to avenge me, that you are going to, by your resurrection, redeem me. You're going to bring something out of this because your way is always best. And I want to do it your way rather than making it worse. Yeah, so let's just turn our face toward heaven for a moment. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we have hope beyond our own control. There is hope beyond 
what we can manage. <laughs> There's hope beyond what we have messed up. There's hope beyond what we, what we wish we could take back. But God, because you sent Jesus into the world to focus on the one who's, who's far away, who doesn't deserve, who's damaged, who's hurt, Lord Jesus, we know you came for us. <laughs> and so we now, we now put our lives in your hand and we say, redeem and restore us through your resurrection. Do in us what only you can do because we are willing to trust you with what's happening in our lives. So right where you're seated right now, wherever you're watching, I'm, uh, listen, Ohio River Campus, right where you are as well, come on, would you just put your hands out in front of you? And I want you to just think about what it is you're afraid of, what it is you're offended by what it is you have been angry about. And maybe even a more profound question, who in your life is like a weight on your chest when you hear their name or you remember what had happened? And with your hands out in front of you, I want you to just say this with me, say this out loud. Say, God, I trust you with this. I believe your way is best and you are able through your resurrection to change this, to restore me, to avenge my pain <laughs> and to restore my life. So I put it in your hands today. Yeah, put your hand on your heart now. Let me just pray over you. God, and I pray that you give us the courage and the grace to act like you, not to be sons of thunder <laughs> in situations. Although our boldness can be good, we just, we just wanna follow you, Jesus. We trust your way is best, have your way within our lives in Jesus' name, amen, amen, awesome. Well, we're gonna turn it over to our campus pastors. We love you guys. And wherever you are, why don't we stand up to our feet and we're gonna sing a new song that is a declaration song. And it's a great way to end this message. And then I'll come back and pray for us before we go. Let's sing together.
from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Come on and own this in this place today, we're going to shout Jesus in faith, come on sing this, shout Jesus for to sing. And um, here's what I'm going to challenge us to do. So I'm going to pray a blessing prayer, and then we're going to go through this song again. And I want to, some of you, I think it'd be good for you to stay around and sing it as a song of declaration and prayer over your family and over your situations. I think we could all stay around and pray it over our nation, right? Because this is an important week in our country. But when you feel to go, we'll release you to go. But if you want to stay, we're going to sing it through one more time and make this declaration. I pray the Lord now would bless you and keep you, that he would free you from fear, set you free from anger, heal the hurt within you, that he'd begin to work in and around and through you, and that he would send you out as a representation of Jesus in the world. And I pray that in, in your life, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. God bless. Let's sing it again as a prayer. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the last minute. What a great message. Again, I love this series that we're in, The Chosen. And Pastor Jeff talking about today that, you know, we want to chase after, you know, being last and not having the ambition to be first and that we are here to serve others. And that's what I took away from this experience this weekend. And also to pray for our nation too, as we were just doing uh, earlier on and, and just making Jesus the center of everything that's going to happen this week. So such a powerful time together. I hope that you had a great experience. Yeah, we hope you guys had a great experience. And if today you decided to give your life to Jesus, one, we just want to say how excited we are that right. you made this decision. So we actually want to talk to you about it. So if you could text 2022 decision to 97,000, or you can even just fill out a connect card on our website or app. Yeah. We just want to talk to you about this and celebrate this amazing day with you. Yeah. And if you'd like to give today, you can do so on our app, our website, or text any dollar amount to 84321. If it's your first time to join us, please feel no pressure at all. We're excited that next week is the Miracle Offering Weekend, and we're excited to see what God is going to do through that. Thank you guys for joining us today. We love you. We'll see you next week.